We're going to try to do a project where we interview people in context with your French Canadian heritage as you experience and how it played out in your own life. So mm -hmm. you just, that's sort of the mindset that we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. And then imagine the video being viewed by someone who's never heard of you, a generation ahead of you, who was interested in their own heritage. Mm -hmm. So they won't have a clue who you were, except mm -hmm. what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. So you can say anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> and they won't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and they won't know the difference. But if we can do that, and <clears throat> if we can do it in conversational style, mm -hmm. uh, we'll just start collecting these and um, uh, making them available on a YouTube channel. Now, I'll, I'll, when I leave here today, we'll give you the, you know, YouTube, of course. We have a, a channel where we have some of the things that have been done so far. Huh. But mm -hmm. you're the first interview like this yeah. that we we're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a real pleasure to be doing it, but because it's the first time, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be imperfect. Probably the second time will be imperfect, and the third and the 28th, <laughs> but, but at least that's sort of the ground mm -hmm. un under which we mm -hmm. are standing. Now, uh, Probably at the end, I'm going to just ask you if you could pick a single word to sum up your French Canadian heritage. So you can sort of be thinking about okay. that a, a little bit. You probably have been since you started thinking about just mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. And what a part that would be interesting for me as we go along, if you're interested to talk about it, you only talk about what you want to talk about. Okay. Uh, but one thing that I think would be interesting particularly interesting from your perspective would be the whole business of uh, becoming a nun. Ah. The, the process. Because that was very common. Mm. And uh, it's not so common anymore. Sure. But how that all happened mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And it'll probably go quite easily just as we just talk. Mm -hmm. But that's one thing that I would be Mm -hmm. interested in mm -hmm. and you know where this where you went to convent and uh, mm -hmm. your teaching career and so forth mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. where where the school was in Crookston okay I, I have never I've been to Crookston obviously quite often but not as a matter of course uh, and the only school I remember that related to the nuns was just to the east of Crookston I suppose the original one where you taught was in town yes yeah. So yeah. that was the provincial house you're thinking of, I bet. Well, whatever was yeah. along the and highway. It was a junior college, too. Yeah, and the junior. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only place I went to junior college. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, then and I'll ask you uh, at the start just to sort of just describe yourself, spell your name, Is a, if there was a French, French pronunciation to it, if you mm -hmm. could give that, uh -huh. uh, how okay. you remember it. And, uh -huh. and uh, then... Uh, We'll go from there. Is there anything else you can think of? Well, I do want a little bit on on the you know the nuns because you know they were they were so much a part of that area and the French Canadian heritage that was up there. It still is up there, but was up there and you know that stuff. Yeah. Sure. Our guy was our first. Doing things is going to be uh, both of us. Uh, my name is Dick Bernard. Uh, both of us will be participating in this conversation, whereas we first planned it to have a conversation with Doreen. So uh, that's basically what we'll do, and we'll just uh, uh, try to deal with our heritage as best we recall it. First thing I'm going to ask, uh, and I'll do it myself first, is I have a little map so we can get ourselves oriented geographically. My, I'm half French Canadian. My dad was 100% French Canadian, and he grew up in Grafton, North Dakota, which is in the northeast corner of North Dakota. And there was a heavy French Canadian presence in the Grafton area, uh, going way back to 1878, 
which is when the first settlers came uh, basically from Minneapolis area up to uh, the Red River Valley. And uh, Doreen, how about for yourself? Um, I am French Canadian. My father and mother both have French Canadian backgrounds, obviously. And um, I think my father uh, bought some land. I think it belonged to his grandfather um, in near Oakley, about southeast of Oakley, Minnesota. Uh, rather, yes, that the farm was located there. And Oakley is about maybe 30 miles southeast of Thief River Falls, and maybe about 50 miles east of Crookston, Minnesota, if that situates the farm. So probably, just geographically speaking, where I grew up was probably 80 miles or so from where you are. I remember my uh, father telling of, of my grandfather driving over to Thief River Falls to visit people. And uh, uh, it was within range. And, and my grandfather was born in 1907. Or my, my dad was born in 1907. Uh, my grandfather had come from Quebec, and my grandmother, her people, had come from Quebec to Minneapolis and then up to Oakwood. Okay. And, and with you? My father was born in 1891, my mother, 1904. Mm -hmm. um, dad had 12 siblings, um, mom had four siblings, five, five siblings, and uh, they both grew up on farms. In fact, my mother and dad lived probably a mile from each other. The story goes, uh, and I'm not sure who told me that, because they lived so close, they knew each other pretty well, and so dad proposed on their first date, mm -hmm. and my mother said yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember with, with my my grandfather was born in 1872 in Quebec, and he was the youngest of 12 kids. And he came west with his brother, who was the miller in a flour mill in Grafton. And my grandfather became the chief engineer of the flour mill. But he, when he came to Oakwood, he was a carpenter. This was 1894, he came there. and. Uh, as best as I can piece it together, I don't have any evidence of this at all, but he happened to be in that area at the time that a priest at the uh, church in Oakwood, Sacred Heart, decided to build a college. And I, it was a rather ambitious thing to do in those years. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that my grandfather was involved in the carpentry work for that project, which was built on land donated by my grandmother's father. Uh, you know, it would be natural that they would get to know each other in that context. And, and uh, Grandpa Bernard lived down the road a piece with the, the Gourd family, G-O-U-R-D-E, at least that's how I pronounce the name. And they married in 1901 in uh, Oakwood, which is where she was born and raised. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you have to meet somebody somewhere, that's <laughs> the basic thought. Uh, this is my grandmother and grandfather, and my dad is the young one, and later on there was a third child born, my Uncle Frank, uh, who later in life uh, went down in the USS Arizona, Pearl Harbor, mm. Hawaii, oh. yeah, as a casualty. But at this time, this was 1908, mm. and uh, uh, this is Henry Bernard is standing, and Josephine, Josephine, I don't know, that's basically how you heard it pronounced, Josephine, and her daughter Josephine, <laughs> the oldest, who became deaf about three years old. Mm from some illness, they think. Mm -hmm. And they found out she was deaf because they lived along a railroad track and they couldn't, she could 
she'd always run to the window to listen to the train as it came by, and then all of a sudden the train came by and she couldn't hear. Uh, she didn't go anyplace. So mm -hmm. she completely lost her hearing, mm -hmm. and she spent the whole rest of her life deaf mm -hmm. and lived in the deaf community in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. California. I could communicate with her. Mm -hmm. uh, she must have lip read, and she, uh, she had been old enough so she had learned to speak. Uh, she went to the uh, deaf school in Devil's Lake, North Dakota. That was where she got her education mm -hmm. and moved to Los Angeles in the 1930s. Okay. So, anyway, you know, we, we all start somewhere. Your father and was a farmer? Yes, my yeah. father was a farmer. This is a picture, uh, this is the, their wedding picture. Uh, my dad married uh, Rebecca Virginia Lambert. No, we we say Lambert. Lambert. Oh, Lambert. In the French, it's Lambert. And um, yes, my my father was a farmer, and his dad was a farmer. And uh, in order to buy that farm, my father would work in the in the woods, as he said. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oakwood was one of the places that uh, he worked in the wintertime. And uh, near Bemidji was another mm -hmm. place where he worked and drove, I don't know how many teams of horses together to pull the huge logs on uh, icy, on made icy roads. Um, so he would do that in the wintertime and then help his dad on the farm in the summertime until he could afford his own farm. Um, it was interesting to observe that the uh, farmers who lived south of Oakley were primarily French Canadian uh, and, and the people north of Oakley uh, were primarily uh, Scandinavian, primarily uh, Norwegian as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I wrote down French names of the people that I had come to know in the Oakley area over the years. There was Rabidou, Boucher, Baudouin, La Coursière, Dufault, Bergeron, Côté, Bernier, Lambert, Dupont, Perrault, Toulouse, Lefebvre, Bruno, Carrière, Archambault, Paquin, did I say that already? Uh, uh, Desaliers, Falardo, Bachand, Riopel, Morissette, those, <laughs> that's just a sampling of the French uh, families. I, I think I can um, one-up you even, uh, <laughs> but not with the pronunciation, which is, <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't grow up in a French community ever, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, my dad was a school teacher, mm -hmm. and we moved a lot to small towns in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't think I ever lived in a place that had a French-Canadian uh, presence of any kind. It was mostly Norwegian and German. Mm -hmm. So anyway, now I'm, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce these names, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce them in French. <laughs> this was the first crop of people to Oakwood, and this is 1878-79. That was real primitive country then. Uh, Barnaby, Boivin, Borchier, Boutin, Brunel, Charpentier, Charpenot, Colette, there were seven Colettes, uh, Dizatel, the Sheen, Donnelly, that doesn't sound French at all, but, you know, <laughs> but the Irish were Catholic, yeah. and that was the common ground, as was true with the Polish as well. Mm -hmm. French, was obvious. Gerard, Goulet, Heward, Leberge, Levant, La Chapelle, La Roche, Lessard, McLernan, that's another Irish group mm -hmm. stuck in there. Parent, Patenaud, Patenaud, Pallant, Poole, Savard, Sullivan, another Irish. Uh, Supernat, mm -hmm. Savard, Trudeau, Barry. And as you can tell, this is the first column, and there's <laughs> two and a half more columns that are longer than uh -huh. this. 
this one. So if you talked about a pure French community, mm -hmm. Oakwood was that. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody spoke French. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember a, a delightful story. I used to do a newsletter called Chez Nous. Ah. And uh, a Mrs. Gord, or she grew up as Gord, and she married a Bizuski, so she was a Polish mm -hmm. mixed marriage. Um, talked about the advice that she got from her mother when she was young. And that was a very simple advice. Never trust an Indian or a Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> they were, you know, it, 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 but it's how things were. They mm -hmm. just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, the Kog and in your community is in Oakley, it would be the same kind of tension. The Norwegians mm -hmm. would speak Norwegian, I would likely, and the French would speak French, and the Norwegians were Lutheran, and the Catholics were French, and 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 so it went. Mm -hmm. uh, I I had a picture. I don't know how, if it's easily. I'll show it to the camera first. That a photographer gave me it from an old Photoshop of a pioneer house. Can you uh, do? Yeah, I got it. Come in on it. It's just an amazing scene of uh, what life was like. And if you look at it right here, oh yes, how primitive uh -huh. this was. Uh -huh. And this was probably along the Red, uh, the Park River, which was, uh -huh. went right by them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know whose farm it is, but more than likely it was some French Canadian uh, farmer mm -hmm. that was living there. Mm -hmm. And that little uh, script piece that I had sent to you yesterday, where, which is a delightful quote about how it was in the really old days. I'm going to read it to you. This is the same woman that talked about the Indians and Norwegians. Uh. These were times when help would be needed by a neighbor, and a white dish towel would be hung in the corner of the house, and either a neighbor came quickly, or maybe a passers-by, but those were few and far between at the time. Uh, in, in our generation, we can understand how this would have made sense sometimes. Mm -hmm. In our kids' generation, they can't understand this at all. And our grandkids, that would be, you may as well be talking about uh, ancient history. Right? For them it is. <laughs> when, and you can imagine this person who puts a white dish towel on the side of the house, and you're never sure even somebody will come by, mm -hmm. much less whether you'll get help for whatever. Right. Uh, might have happened that would cause that. No phones in those days, no Yeah, really. no yes. phones, no yes. telephones, no television. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, it was a it was a different kind of a mm -hmm. world. So let's go back to your story for a moment now, and, and I'll I'll chime in after a bit for my own. So you grew up on a farm, yes. and you were in what rank order in your family? I was third of the family of four. Okay. And three three brothers. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we all went to public school. Um, my oldest brother um, got to learn French very fluently from my parents. Um, and when he started school in this little country school, um, he got along very well with the teacher because she was French Canadian as well, mm -hmm. and a neighbor. And uh, but. Uh, not knowing English well was a handicap for my oldest brother. And my mother and dad came to realize that, and mom said, she told me this later, uh, never again would I send my kids to school without their knowing English well. And so she would, they would speak to us in French or English and not require a French response from us. We responded always in English, but we came to understand uh, the French uh, language quite well ourselves. I, I, I need to interject. Uh, my uh, <clears throat> my dad was a teacher, and he had a master's degree, and he was a very intelligent man. 
And we were at a reunion in 1994. I'll remember this as long as I live. And we were in Dubuque, Iowa, uh, the, the German reunion. And my mother had died by then. And he called us kids together in the hotel room for some meeting. And he was extremely serious. He was just very, very serious. <laughs> and we couldn't understand what in the world. Do we have a brother that we don't know about somewhere? <laughs> or was he in jail sometime? That was how serious it, it sounded. So then he told the story. He, he, he had lived with shame his whole life because he had been held back a grade. Mm -hmm. First grade. Because he couldn't speak English. And then he just completely lost the French language. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever heard him. Uh, he never lost the love for the language, but he never ever would speak something. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And it was even sitting here, I get emotional about this. Mm -hmm. It was it was such a traumatic event for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing it was true for a lot of kids. And then the uh, the uh, uh, as with your mother, the emphasis gets on assimilation. You speak English, you speak English, you speak English. Mm -hmm. I have uh, relatives in, in Manitoba who are French speaking as a first language, and they do flow freely between French and English mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. But they also can get education in French still in some yes. places in Manitoba, mm -hmm. but not in the US. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a good, good story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I think it, it, it affected more than just our own mm -hmm. people, you know. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. So how about other things? I had given you a list of heritage things. Are there things that you came to mind as you were looking at that list that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the French priests who were pastors uh, <laughs> in Oakley, Minnesota, as I was growing up. Uh, the first priest I came to know was Father Keel, Patnode. You mentioned a Patnode in your, in your list. And I think he was in, in Oakley a total of 30-some years with a, an interruption, if you want to call it that, of pastoring in Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Uh, of course, he spoke uh, French very fluently and English as well. And I don't know that I remember this, but I think I was told it that he would he had very long sermons, uh, partly because he gave a sermon in both languages, French and English. Um, a, a little story uh, shared by a young priest who came to know Father Patnod, uh and, and his long homilies. And, uh, um, but he said, now, Father Patnod, how, how do you know when to stop? Uh, you know, when your when your homily, they were called sermons in those days, how your sermon came to an end. And he said, well, I, I put a piece of hard candy in, in my pocket. And as I start to speak, I put the hard candy in my mouth, and when it melts, then I know that I'm done. Oh my God. But he said, one time, I made a mistake, and I put a button in my pocket. <laughs> so, in other words, <laughs> you can never tell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Father Patnode uh, had a great sense of humor, of course. It's an illustration of that. Um, and he was very uh, gregarious and very ecumenical in, in his day. One of his uh, favorite buddies was Oli Savdi, who had a grocery store in Oakley. That sounds Norwegian. <laughs> yes. And... Um, and uh, so Father would pick up groceries there, and they'd have a good time uh, during that uh, experience, that shopping experience. And Father had a raucous laugh. And one time when he was in Subby's store, he laughed hilariously. And a little child in its mother's arms says, Mommy, where's the dog? <laughs> Uh, but uh, he had a very kind heart and uh, very compassionate. And he would be the, the uh, driver of people to the hospital in Crookston. That was the closest 
uh, 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 approach to, to health care in, in Crookston. Um, as it affected me, uh, he could sense, I think, that uh, maybe religious life was, I was meant for religious life. Um, the Sisters of St. Joseph had St. Joseph's Academy started in 1903, no, 1905, um, and it quickly became a boarding school and um, we had large classes both in the grade school and the high school. Uh, but after the school year was over, the sisters offered retreats to the gals who weren't able to go to the academy or to Mount St. Benedict in Crookston. And we'd, we'd have priests who were diff from different religious communities, Redemptorist, for example. And um, after, at the end of my junior year, Father Patton had announced that he was going to the priest's retreat in Crookston, which happened to coincide with the girls' retreat at the academy. And he announced from the pulpit that if there were young women who were interested in going to the girls' retreat, that they could ride with him. And um, he wasn't addressing me. I didn't think he was addressing me at the time. However, uh, in a day or two following, he came to the farm and uh, started visiting with my mother. And he said, Rebecca, is, is Doreen going to go to that retreat? And my mother, wise woman that she was, said, I don't know. You'll have to ask her. <laughs> so um, I didn't have an answer for him. I hadn't considered it. Mm -hmm. But by the time he left, I was going to the retreat. <laughs> and it was at that point that um, I really felt I was being called to be a sister. Um, and, and so I considered that, I pondered that during my senior year. Uh, after which I went to another retreat and felt really confirmed in that direction. And so I entered the community in September of, of that year. And where was the community? That was in Crookston. In Crookston. Yeah, the, the formation <clears throat> place was there. And so uh, I was a postulant for, I think it was a year in those days, or probably no, nine months, I believe. And in March, we received the, the habit and we were novices for uh, one year, I believe. We made first vows, and then um, temporary vows could be three years or as long as needed. Um, and then I went to the uh, College of St. Catherine in St. Paul, and I majored in English and minored in Latin. And having known something of the, the French language, um, I saw a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the French language was a derivative from the Latin language, I believe. Yeah. Um, and you, I uh, excuse me for a second. Did you begin after high school or? Yes. Okay, so you In first the, of all graduated from high school. Yes. And then you went into the Correct. convent. Correct. Okay. Yes. Right. And just a, a little aside, um, I was able to take some electives at one point, and uh, one elective I chose was French 1. And I knew I could take it only for one quarter, but I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. Uh, so I enrolled and had a wonderful teacher. Uh, and I was able to write to my mother a, a short letter in French. And she cherished that letter because it was written in French by her daughter. And uh, so that was a great deal of fun. I don't think she kept the letter. At least I didn't see it when I went through her papers after she died. I, uh, <clears throat> my dad wanted to be a priest. Uh, he was uh, in Grafton. There were three boys that palling around together. They called themselves the, the Great Triumvirate for some reason, you know. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Kids come up with names. Yes. And they were the altar boys. That was their profession. Uh, he 
wanted to become a priest in the worst way, but he could not get Latin. Uh. Latin stumped him, and that was a, a prerequisite for going anywhere. Right. Uh, if you're going to be a priest, priest back then. Yes. His best friend uh, became a monsignor and was a pastor in North Dakota for many, many years. Uh, and the other boy sort of dropped out because of, they were on hard times and he had to help out with mm -hmm. at home. Sure. But uh, the, the church for him, and I guess I would bet that this is probably more true with French Canadians than with a lot of other national groups. The church uh, was an extremely important entity in, mm -hmm. in his life, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. his whole, his whole sure. life. And uh, uh, we didn't have, there were, he had five children. Uh, my Aunt Josie, the one who was deaf, uh, married, but her husband died after two years of goiter. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, brother died in Arizona. Pearl Harbor, so we're the only kids that come from out of mm -hmm. that particular family. There aren't a lot of grandkids mm -hmm. of that family. But the, the church was very a central entity. Uh, Indeed. In, in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, and I don't, I'm still active Catholic. Mm -hmm. Being an active Catholic doesn't mean you all think alike, as, mm -hmm. as we all know. Um, but for me, it's the Basilica of St. Mary, <clears throat> where I usher almost every weekend. Uh, okay. and, uh, uh, we all have our stories about the church yes. <laughs> yes. and ourselves. Mm -hmm. How about um, at home, were there any kind of uh, Frenchy kind of traditions that you could remember? One thing that I remember, the first thing that came to my mind was um, my mother always making tourtière, oh, yes. which was a, uh, I think it was a meat pie, meat pie. of some kind, mm -hmm. and that was that was a Christian uh, Christmas tradition. I don't remember our Thanksgiving celebrations, um, but speaking of dedication to the faith or living out the faith, uh, my parents certainly did that. In fact, my dad had three sisters who became Sisters of St. Benedict in Duluth, Minnesota. Mm. Um, they came home to visit only every five years, so I didn't get to know them very well. Um, I came to know the Sisters of St. Joseph quite well because they always came to Oakley, St. Francis Xavier Parish, in the summertime for two weeks of catechism, full days, two weeks, um, and so I felt I was growing up with them, and I really got attached to them. Um, and then, and Father Patnode kept on my case <laughs> and would invite me and others to go to the academy in Crookston for their plays, or to Crookston for uh, CYO gatherings. And so I was more drawn to Crookston than I was to Duluth. And so that was kind of a natural that I would enter that community. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the community that first established in, in Argyle in 1903. And um, so the academy became came home to me. And, and one of the sisters and uh, one of the, the boarders wrote to, kept writing to me during my senior year. And that was by design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. um, so that I wouldn't forget that uh, I had expressed interest in, in that community. I got to be good friends with five elderly nuns <clears throat> at the uh, uh, at Coronelet, at the mm -hmm. nursing home for the St. Josephs. Oh yes, uh, mm -hmm. I forget what it's called. The, but but they all lived there, and they were all college professors, every one mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Ellen Murphy, was a wonderful poet. Her mother was a French Canadian. Okay. She told me one day about how it was to become a nun mm -hmm. uh, in some detail. And mm -hmm. basically, 
what it sounded to me like, I have a son that just got out of, or a grandson that just got out of basic training in the Marines. And the biggest deal with Marine basic training or any military basic training is you have to rebuild the person from the ground up and you, you cut off all contacts with the outside world. And these days, no cell phone, <laughs> one letter perhaps. And the same thing I, I gathered was true when um, a person went into the convent so that you weren't too much distracted by wanting to go home and you, you, your community became your, your family, your, your sister, <laughs> family. Yeah. And uh, but she told me the, the basic, you know, the, you couldn't read newspapers and things. Uh, anything that would take you out of the world that you were entering was until you were able to handle it. And then I, mm -hmm. I was in, I graduated from high school in 1958. Uh, well, that is the year that Pius XII died, and the year that John the Twenty Third became Pope. And for anybody who's Catholic, that's a sort of a important time in, in, the, in the history of the Church where we <clears throat> went from what I would call the old Church to the contemporary Church. You know, it, it sort of wiggles back and forth. But uh, in the good old days, they weren't so good in terms of relations with other denominations or, uh, you know, the Latin was... You always had the missile with the two languages, mm -hmm. English and or French and mm -hmm. Latin. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I was in college when all those dramatic changes started. When you would be able to take somebody down to see what the Catholic Church was like, and they would marvel at how he had his kneel, sit, stand, <laughs> <laughs> and the priest was always looking away, you know, right. at the altar and so forth. But uh, those those were quite the days. In terms of my own family, because we lived uh, in many different places that were not French, I don't think we had any traditions at all that directly related back to French. But for sure, the tortier was uh, something my dad remembered extremely well. I did a, about a year ago, I did a thing for a program that we had based on writing that my dad had done. And he had written, for instance, about his mother making tortier, which in, in their case, they, they lived in town and they lived in Grafton. But they had a little barn behind, and every year, Grandpa would get a pig, and they'd fatten the pig. And because he worked at the mill, they got all the stuff to make a pig really fat. fat. <laughs> <laughs> and in the fall, they would butcher mm -hmm. the pig. And it was all that goes on with butchering a pig. And Grandma would make all sorts of tortillas pies, and she would put them on the back porch to where the sun wouldn't shine, and they'd stay frozen all winter. So when, they, when you wanted to have a, a tortier, she'd go out and bring <laughs> one and put it in the stove, and, and it was ready to go. Um, same thing was true uh, with pea soup, which she, mm -hmm. I took them once when he came down to visit me once in the cities to a French-Canadian thing. I had just been getting active in French-Canadian, and they had made a big, big, big cauldron full of yellow pea soup. And yellow pea soup is the pea soup. <laughs> None of this green pea stuff. Yellow peas was what it was. And I would have thought my dad had died and gone to heaven <laughs> when, he, when he ate that soup. Uh -huh. So that was part of his tradition as well, you know. And he was a town kid. He wasn't from the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, as, as I look through these, I mean, otherwise, basically the kind of things that are elements of heritage, all of us sort of share them, but 
uh, for sure the church was a big deal for us. And if you were lucky enough, you would have some ethnic things with uh, things like uh, food, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have, uh, in terms of observances, he always would go to midnight mass. He would always go to midnight mass. Mm -hmm. I don't recall ever that they had a meal after midnight mass, but that was a sort of a traditional thing, I think, with, yes. within the French Canadians. Mm -hmm. And again, I used to be in in uh, Minneapolis as Our Lady of Lourdes, and I was a member of Our Lady of Lourdes for a couple of years, and in 80, 81 or so, and uh, they were still doing the after midnight mass, big deal yeah. meal. I think they even had a name for it, and I don't recall what it was, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it was a feast. Mm -hmm. But you had the dues you had to pay was to go to midnight. <laughs> you had to go to midnight mass, which meant you had to be up after midnight. But they would go, regardless of the weather. They would go. That was mm -hmm. that was uh, mm -hmm. the holy day of holy days, as mm -hmm. far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other French Canadian holidays. You know, the the New Year's I think was a big deal too. Um, but it, again, we would never lived in a community where that kind of thing was was observed. Um, I just want to insert here that uh, my father told me that uh, he was an altar server when he was a kid. And uh, the parish priest at that time was Père Roy, Father Roy. Oh. <laughs> and I, I remember his telling us that in French, mm -hmm. that he was a server. Um, uh, another of the uh, French Canadian background pastors that we had was Father Paul Cardin. Mm -hmm. Cardin. Uh, uh, he had a, a priest brother as well who yeah. became a Monsignor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did not come to know him very well, um, but uh, I think he was pastor at St. Francis at your parish starting in 1952, maybe 51, um, so I didn't get to know him that well. Oh, also, also um, we went to a public school, as I said, and on Wednesdays we had what was called release time. So I think it was, for the most part, from 11 until noon, uh, we were able to go to the parish church or the sacristy actually uh, and, and we had a catechism in those days and we were expected to become very familiar with the catechism and uh, Father Paul, Father Patnode or Father Paul Carton would teach us during that one hour and the public school released us uh, and in fact the public school was right across the street from, from the church and so Father Patno uh, let it be known that he was aware of what was going on <laughs> in the public school. <laughs> and he did not like, didn't like it when the girls who wore skirts did uh, somersaults and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, well, cheerleaders, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Or, or just Fayed or yeah. whatever. Cartwheels in the yeah. schoolyard. That's right, yeah. cartwheels, yes. <laughs> uh, a funny thing uh, about Father uh, Pat, no, I told you he had a good sense of humor. Uh, the boys would be sitting in the front row during these catechism classes deliberately <laughs> by, by design. And uh, one time, one of the boys yawned in class and, and Father Pat no, leaned over and pretended that he could see inside the mouth of this child and said, <laughs> oh, you had scrambled eggs for breakfast. Oh, God. <laughs> It was it was so central, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. I guess it doesn't surprise me that quite a bit of the time that we're talking here floats back to the the church. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm 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 guessing that a Norwegian Lutheran it would could have the same kind of stories mm -hmm. about their own denomination or you know mm -hmm. other uh, 
denominations as well. It was sort of a mm -hmm. community center, and it was a place where things happened. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, are there any other things that you can think of? Otherwise, I'm going to ask you that last question I was going to ask you. Okay, I had a little uh, outline for myself too. Did you know where they came from in Quebec? That you're really your um, early ancestors? You know, I do have some literature here. Um, my grandfather, George, whose name was George also, uh, with his parents, Francoise Charé and Valérie Beryl Charé, came from the Quebec province in Canada to Lambert Township. He homesteaded the farm that is still in the family. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's my grandpa George. Okay. And so my dad was George Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dad had a son, Theophil. Um, that's a good French name. Theophil and Walter. They farmed the, the, the uh, original farm uh, on which my dad was born. Mm -hmm. And um, grandpa had a brother, Fred, who bought a farm nearby. Uh, he had another, two other brothers, Napoleon, uh, who was a farmer, and Camille, who was a blacksmith. Then they settled in the Minneapolis area. Mm -hmm. Is this what you were asking me? Well, yeah, did you know where they came from? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. They're, yeah, they're explaining that. And there was another, Jeus, J-E-U-S. I had never heard that name before. And, but I remember Dad mm -hmm. pronouncing it, Jeus. Mm -hmm. Remained in Canada near Montreal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he had a sister, Exilia, married Raphael Hamill, and another sister, Zoe, who married Adolphus Rowe. And my grandpa, George, married Olivine Paquin, Paquin who was born in St. Ursula, St. Ursul, <laughs> Canada, but had moved to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, then to Lambert, where her parents homesteaded. Mm -hmm. Uh, my grandpa, George, was treasurer of the school board of District 9 for approximately 50 years. <laughs> he also served as the town's treasurer for a number of years. Uh, so that little yeah. bit of background. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I asked you before we started, we can, we can float back into this if other things come to mind, but I, okay. I was <clears throat> thinking about this, and to talking about your Frenchness, your Frenchness uh, specifically, you know, if you had to pick a single word to sum up your French Canadian heritage as manifested in your own life, what do you think it would be? And if you can't do it in a word, in a, in, in a phrase, what would, what would make you French Canadian from your background growing up? I would say faith-filled and industrious. Okay. They were hard-working people. They had to be to uh, work the land mm -hmm. and uh, raise crops and feed animals and themselves. Uh, and we talked, I think, at some length about their faith and their the seriousness mm -hmm. with which they took their faith. We always prayed the rosary on our knees after supper. Oh, absolutely. And we could not go out and play ball with the neighbors uh, until we had prayed the rosary on our knees. <laughs> we had the same exact rule. Yeah. There was no option. Yes. No getting out of it. <laughs> I, uh, I like your faith, Phil. You know, as irritated as I get at the church, and I get very irritated mm -hmm. at the church, I'm uh, I'll always be Catholic, you know. And again, then it, you get the definition of your Catholic or what are you, you know? Right. Uh, but I'm I'm Catholic, and that and, and a lot of it comes out of my parents, both of them, mm -hmm. uh, but my dad in particular. Mm -hmm. But the word that I had picked for myself, sometimes it's uh, albatross for me. Mm -hmm. 
is the word responsible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I take that so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I don't, uh, I, I can't let, let go of it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it, um, and I, do you understand what I'm <laughs> saying about it? You know, it, sometimes you become too serious. You become too serious about this or that. And, mm -hmm. um, but that's the word that I would have picked for myself mm -hmm. if I was going to do that. I, I want to illustrate uh, Faith Field too. Um, in my parents' bedroom, uh, just above the, the headboard was a framed picture of Jesus. And the, the wording was, Christ is the head of this house. Hmm. And uh, we couldn't miss it. Every time we went to the par our parents' bedroom, we saw that. Yeah. Christ is the head of this yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't have anything else. Uh, this, I think, this has been a good start. And uh, if you have, you have other comments you want to go through, some things. Uh, I think. Um, I, th I think that about covers. Okay. Uh, I didn't talk much about my my uh, adulthood as a sister. <laughs> um, after I'd graduated from the College of St. Catherine, I became a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy. And I had students like <laughs> Pat. <laughs> the video lady here. Yeah, the video, the video lady. lady. Yeah. Uh, and then I became, I went to St. Thomas uh, University in St. Paul to get my master's in school administration and uh, another master's in the teaching of religion and became a principal at Grady High School in West St. Paul, which opened in 1964. I was there for six years. Uh, after that, I became involved in a leadership team for my community, the Sisters of St. Joseph. And since our mother house was in France, we needed to travel there for meetings occasionally. And uh, that was such a gift for me also to mm -hmm. learn something about my French roots. Mm -hmm. And um, I could understand some of the, uh, that's mine, <laughs> I could understand some of the French, uh, but I was so delighted to have as the official translator for us during that, that gathering, um, uh, Sister Ephraim Sauvé. Oh. She knew French very well. Yes. She taught French. And so I was by her side a lot <laughs> uh, during those meetings. And Sister Blondine Kenzieu, do you remember her? Mm -hmm. She was also a translator. And so she, both of them were great additions in the work of updating our archives and in our transitioning from being a French congregation to being uh, a new American congregation back in the 70s. So, and we had what was called a chapter there with represent, representatives from the French communities and from the American communities. And so we did a prayerful discernment about uh, forming a new American congregation because there, was, there were plenty of differences mm -hmm. and so much to do in the American scene and they with the, with the French uh, ministries as well. I wanted to show you one prop that I brought along. This my grandfather made this. Oh, okay. He made, uh, I think he, he made several of them. They're in the whiskey bottles. Yes, like a ship in, like yeah, a ship yeah, in yeah, the bottles. Yeah, this is a crucifix uh -huh. in the bottle. And uh, there's other of them around. I had never seen one. And it's, it's held together for all of these years, however long ago he made them. Uh -huh. I'm sure he made use of the whiskey before. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't dump it out. <laughs> it, but uh, he was, he, as I said at the beginning, he was a carpenter. And these were in the old days when you carpentry was with a hand saw and, and a miter box and uh -huh. He did very detailed work, and you can tell uh -huh. that he he had to build this outside the the bottle first, and then wow. 
do a piece by piece, you know, glue pieces yes. together and so forth. And he did it, did it right, mm -hmm. for sure. Yes. He was a real character. I remember Grandpa one time, he had lost his leg through diabetes. That's what finally killed him. He mm -hmm. lost his second leg. But we were visiting in their little tiny house in Grafton. He, they, they had hard times in the depression, really hard times. But uh, <laughs> this, this is by the, the county building in Grafton. They were about a block down the street, and they had a little porch on their front stoop, you know. And he was sitting there with us kids, and he had a little can full of stones and a slingshot there, and he was reminded us that that was what they were there for, and down the street comes a dog, you know, just trotting down the dog, minding, uh, uh, down the street, minding its own business, and he says, watch that dog, and so we looked, you know, little kids, are so there's going to be some action here. <laughs> this dog gets to the next lot over and makes a hard right and goes across the street. <laughs> A hard left, <laughs> a hard left, you know, it, it knew, it knew what Grandpa did with, <laughs> with that slingshot and those stones. And at the back door he had a little BB gun for whatever, his barman purposes, so he was a real, it was interesting. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I want to call attention to um, Koya Knudsen. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, she was a teacher in uh, at the Oakley High School when I was there, and she taught English. She was not my teacher of English, but she taught music as well, and she had some glee clubs and and uh, different uh, groups for for singing, and and we performed, you know, and I enjoyed that a lot. Um, Koya Kamu. Koya, yes, she served two terms in the Minnesota House of Representatives from 51 to 55, before winning the election to the U.S. House of Representatives from Minnesota's 9th Congressional District as a, as a Democrat. She served two terms there, from 55 to 59. So she was the first woman elected to Congress, this was in the 50s now, mm -hmm. from Minnesota, and is remembered today for the notorious Koya Come Home yeah. letter supposedly written by her then estranged husband, Andy, urging her to give up her seat and not seek re-election. Political rivals had put him up to it, and it was seen as instrumental in her ensuing defeat. The incident is often cited as an example of sexism in American politics. So Koya, she was born in North Dakota. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yes, uh, to, in Edmore, okay. Edmore, North Dakota. In 1912, and she died in 1996 in Edina. So, what was her maiden name? Her maiden you know? name was Jestal. Jestal. G G J E S D A H L. I think Edmore is west of Grand Forks. I think. Could be yeah. Ramsey County, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. She grew up on the farm and inherited her politics from her dad, who belonged to the socialist organization called the Nonpartisan League. Mm -hmm. She went to Concordia, uh, and she wanted. A, she thought she had a career in opera, and she went to the Juilliard School for a year, and realized that that was not her calling. And um, so she taught music in English, as I said, and sang at county fairs, and worked with her husband to run a small ho local hotel. And I remember he was also a school bus driver, as I recall. And uh, he had some problems with yeah. uh, alcohol. And uh, so the marriage was on the rocks. They adopted uh, a child, Terry, and I remember Terry, uh, when he was eight years old. Uh, they adopted him at that point. And then um, she decided, she served first at Red Lake County Public Welfare Board in 1948. She chaired the county DFL committee attended the Democratic presidential, presidential Convention as a delegate, 
And finally, they asked her to run for the state house. So she did. And uh, anyway, there's a book about her called Koya, Come Home. Um, so I claim her as a Pioneer. former teacher. Pioneer. <laughs>